So hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. Today guys, today you see me at my desk instead of in my filming room. And that is because today, just like the last time I was at my desk and filmed a video, I am be going to be doing a tier list, only the second tier list to appear on the channel. The last one, if you did not see it, was my uh, at ranking every Discworld tier list. And uh, I had to, again, I hadn't reread re those books in forever, so a lot of it was like remembering uh, how I ranked them um, as I start my reread of these series. Um, and some I hadn't even read, and I just had to guess, so who knows. But today, guys, today I will be filming the fantasy subgenres tier list. So this tier list, uh, the idea for this tier list, I first saw uh, like almost a year ago on my friend Jashana's channel. And I think this was before I was even friends with Jashana. I saw it on her channel. And I wanted to do it, but a lot of the categories that in the one that Shana had made, like I didn't really have anything to say about. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm gonna take that same idea. And I'm gonna add some some extra subgenres that I probably have more to say about, and then film that. And I told myself I was gonna do that like almost a year ago, and I didn't. And now I am finally doing it. And it's a good thing that I waited because now, uh, having gotten back into reading, I understand kind of more what each of these uh, subgenres kind of, kind of means. And, you know, subgenres, it doesn't have to mean anything or genre. A genre. As Alex Trebek. Uh, used to say. As I have been reading and been on booktube over the last year or so, and anyone who reads for an extended period of time or over a long period of time, you learn what you like and what you don't like about books and really also the kind of things that you're most attracted to in books. And when you're reading fantasy, you know, Fantasy is a huge umbrella, and even some sub subgenres have subgenres, and then those subgenres have subgenres. It's just madness. So, this is just an effort to kind of lay out the types of fantasy books that I like the most, and what I like to see most in my fantasy books, at least as far as like, you know, setting and uh, just types of fantasies. Uh, I'm gonna make a video later of just the, the more specific things that I really like to see in fantasy, but for now, this should serve. Now, these subgenres don't always have to mean the same thing to everyone. As I talk about some of these subgenres, you, you may disagree with my interpretation of them, and that's fine. BestFantasyBooks.com has a really good breakdown of pretty much all, uh, or as many fantasy genre, subgenres as they uh, as they listed, and that's where, that is the website that I chose these 24 subgenres. I just looked at those and picked 24 that I thought I would have something to say about and put them in this. Now, I glanced over that just to make sure I kind of knew what I was saying, but I'm not going to sit there and read the definition to you. I'll put the definition in my own words and then say what it kind of means to me, and if you disagree, you know, that's fine. Make your own tier list, and that's totally fine. I will put uh, both Jashana's original video and my template down in the description so that if any of you want to do this, I would totally love to see where your answers stack up compared to mine. So, without Ace wasting any more time, Let's do the fantasy sub-genre genre. tier list. All right, so I have S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier, and D tier. So we got so good, pretty good, that's fine, pass, and trash tier. All right, so let's go ahead and start. So vampire fantasy. <sighs> Man, guys, I have never been someone who super loves vampires. Like, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s where, like, the Lestat craze was big and then Vampire the Masquerade, which is not an RPG I ever played. It was before Twilight and the, you know, the huge boom of vampire fiction. Um, so I, I did like vampires when I was a kid because I liked Strahd von, Strahd von Zarevich um, of Ravenloft fame. But now I hate vampires. And vampires are just one of these, like, creatures that... They're just all the same. Most vampire, like, descriptions of vampire books that I see, they're always aimed at, like, teenagers and, I don't know, vampires just aren't cool. Like, I think vampires have lost some of their, like, mythical creature uh, cachet. Uh, feel free to disagree, it's fine. But I certainly don't like Twilight, and I don't like Anne Rice, and I don't like, what is that, the Sookie Stackhouse? Is that True Blood? I don't like any of that crap. I think vampires are lame. I, I do like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but all the vampires were lame. Like, I liked Buffy the Monster Slayer significantly better. So I don't really like 
vampire fantasy like at all. I don't, I don't like vampires. So some pass, pass on vampire. So YA fantasy, so don't get upset. YA fantasy, for the purposes of this, YA fantasy is fantasy that is intended for younger audience. That's all it is. Uh, young adult fantasy. And guys, I didn't say it before, but understand that many, many of these genres, they overlap. So just because something is YA fantasy does not mean it is also not YA vampire fantasy or YA um, assassin fantasy. Um, I'm just talking about YA fantasy in general. And I'm not trashing YA and people like to read YA. One of my favorite books so far this year was Fireborn, which was a YA, uh, which is a YA book. And so I don't hate YA because it's YA, but I tend not to enjoy YA very much. Um, and that's mostly because it's younger protagonists and the tropes that tend to be present in young adult novels um, and tend to are not really tropes that I like. So really, I like young adult books better than I like vampires. So I'm going to still put it in pass because I don't really read YA. So I'm going to put it in pass. Military fantasy. So military fantasy is one of my favorite subgenres because... Um, I love war. Like, don't make a gift of that. I, I, I like reading about war, and I like seeing two forces on a battlefield in conflict, and I love the strategies and the tactics about, uh, I mean, again, you know, one of the things that is my bailiwick is like, you know, the Romans and the Greeks, and that history is, is just peopled with war. And so I really like well-done military fantasy. So when there are armies at war, um, you know, men taking the field because war to me stopped being interesting with the invention of automatic weapons because now, I don't know, reading about that is not interesting to me. Like reading about you have your Gatling gun, that's not super interesting to me. You have your, you know, your Uzi, that's not super interesting to me. But military fantasy fighting with, um, you know, it, it's fine if it's like slow, slow loading guns or cannons and stuff like that. But I just really like watching the generals and from the soldier's point of view, uh, good fantasy, uh, military fantasy. Uh, Bernard Cornwell does the best like historical fiction, which is that, but without the fantasy. Um, but Malazan has some of the, my favorite military fantasy scenes. Um, in fact, that's why I read Malazan. I don't read it for the navel gazing. I read it for the military scenes. Um, the Shadow Campaigns is excellent military fantasy. The Black Company books are military fantasy, though the, the Black Company series is stronger than any of the individual books. Uh, Guns of the Dawn is military fantasy and is fantastic. So military fantasy is in, it is so good. It's in the so good category, absolutely. All right, political fantasy. Oh, this is also so good. So, oh man, do I like the political machination more than I like the battlefield tactics because I love political elements, uh, political intrigue in my fantasy novels. Like I like when uh, they're they are out trying to outmaneuver everybody like Tyrion in Game of Thrones and the, really Game of Thrones and Clash of Kings especially where um, there's all this kind of like you know, conniving and all that kind of stuff. I love that stuff in my books. Uh, Folding Knife had a ton of that, which I really, really like. Um, oh, these are really close. I don't know. I'll play with that later. So these are really, really close. But I really like when you don't know how something is going to end up. Long Price Quartet has a lot of uh, politicking. You don't know how um, the story's going to play out because everyone's, you know, there's that court intrigue. Everyone's trying to uh, get a leg up on the other guy. And uh, I just really like that stuff. It's like a game of chess being battled between great minds. Like, polit like I don't know. I just, I, it's, it's, it's like military fantasy, but without the armies. So I love political intrigue. Um, it's definitely S tier for me. Swashbuck, what the crap? I got all these ones that I like right up at the top. So swashbuckling, um, swashbuckling fantasy um, is a new term that I just dis that uh, I just discovered that applies to books like Great Coats is a really good example of swashbuckling fantasy. I define swashbuckling fantasy as if it would be appropriate in your book to have someone swinging from a chandelier in the middle of a fight. That is swashbuckling fantasy. Movie, like books and movies that are like a good time, that are fast moving and and kind of adventure focused, like it's like like an adventure game, if you will. Like I, I would consider swashbuckling fantasy like movies, like like Indiana Jones or National Treasure, that kind of stuff. Or The Mummy is like a swashbuckling. The Mummy is probably a good example of a swashbuckling fantasy, and those are so fun for me. Um, Senlin Ascends is not so much, at, but the second book, Armor of the Sphinx, is very swashbuckling. Um, often pirates are involved in this, but not always, but it's really like, it's just a fast moving, it, they're, they're, they're very rarely ponderous, the pace is always really good, 
these are some of my favorites. Like I love great coats. And I also don't like, I just don't like things that are a drag. All right, I'm gonna mess with it. My So Good tier in a minute. It's definitely So Good, some of my favorites. Portal Fantasy. So, I don't, I mean, Portal Fantasies I think are fine. I don't really love Portal Fantasy. Portal Fantasy, young Alan, baby Alan, was a big fan of Portal Fantasy because um, you know, when I was first like learning to write or tell my own stories, it was about, you know, me and my friends going to these cool, these cool realms. So I really liked Portal Fantasy a lot when I was younger. And now I just don't like, I don't care for the most things from our world being in fantasy world. So Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a Portal Fantasy. And there are several, there are, there are more. I just don't know them a lot because I don't read a lot of Portal Fantasy. But I mean, they're fine. I don't have anything against it. But like, oh, this kid from Maryland was pulled into the this fantasy kingdom and now she has to marry the, the king or the whole empire dies or something. I mean, it's fine, I guess. I don't, I don't dislike it. Uh, like the way I dislike vampire fantasy, but yeah, it's fine. I mean, it, it, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Nothing wrong with it. Flintlock fantasy. So Flintlock fantasy, I will not gonna have a problem here. Flintlock fantasy is hands down my favorite. Flintlock fantasy is my favorite fantasy subgenre. A genre. And this is because so Flintlock fantasy also fits very. Flintlock fantasy. My definition of Flintlock fantasy also encompasses kind of steampunk, gas lamp fantasy. So for me, so Flintlock fantasy at its most narrow is fantasy that involves technology around the Napoleonic era. So it's it's like early industrial technology with uh, technology levels. So it, it can have cannons, muskets, uh, rifles. That's kind of what Flintlock fantasy is, though. Flintlock pistols, Flintlock uh, rifles, etc. And that's it. No, no more like advanced tech. But Flintlock fantasy, to me, also encompasses things before that, like like series that don't have guns, but are kind of like, but kind of have a Victorian feel. Like there's gas lamp, maybe a little bit of tech. There's some guns, but like maybe you know, maybe they have some kind of electric thing or or gas or steam powered thing. Um, and it also goes a little bit in the other direction for me towards steampunk. But really, the most the the two most obvious are uh, Promise of Blood, or the Powder Mage trilogy by Brian McClellan, and um, The Shadow Campaigns by Django Wexler. These are the two big ones. Um, I've read all the Shadow Campaigns, but I've not read the P Powder Mage trilogy yet because I did not like Promise of Blood because it was just a squandered thing. And maybe I'm, maybe that is why, because I look at the the ratings for Promise of Blood, 35,000 ratings on Goodreads, and it's a 4.1. Did y'all read the same book as I did? Do you know that at some point, the guy looks down and sees, he says, oh, there's a million troops down there. Like, do you know how many bodies a million is? There, I don't think there's been a battle in the history of the world that has involved one million combatants on the battlefield simultaneously. Like climbing up, like trying to scale one mountain. I, I don't think it's possible. Like, it's, that's the entire, that is the, the entire population of Rome at its peak. And it's just like, how did no one catch that? Who writes that? I did not like Promise of Blood. I am going to finish it, though, because, fun fact, me and my friend Angela have just recently been talking about wanting to read more Flintlock fantasy and its kind of surrounding subgenres. A genre. Because, uh... After Promise of Blood, we ended up reading Guns of the Dawn, which was amazing because we were looking for more Flintlock fantasy. And whenever people ask me for Flintlock fantasy, there it's not a huge subgenre. A genre. But there is more than Powder Mage and Shadow Campaigns and now Guns of the Dawn. And so we wanted to explore that. And so we made a spreadsheet of a bunch of books or series that are kind of uh, either Flintlock like fantasy or very close or have that kind of similar vibe. And so we're going to start going through those. Um, just periodically, so that we can kind of become uh, better experts at Flintlock Fantasy and better able to recommend other Flintlock Fantasy books to people like us who really like that aesthetic. So um, I will I will definitely be doing a list like that once we uh, I read more of those, um, and that'll start soon. We're, I think I'm reading one of the Powder Mage novellas uh, first, as well as some other series I'll be starting soon on that. So pay attention for that if that interests you. But Flintlock Fantasy, I've always been fascinated by having tech, but not too advanced tech in my fantasy novels. Always, like always, like every D and D game campaign I've ever run has had low tech. 
Um, every like story I've I've written has ended up having some kind of low. T I just love the thoughts of guns and cannons, um, or you know, pistols in fantasy books, and I love it. I love it. Flint like fantasy. It is. Um, it's one of my favorites. So magical realism is like I think magical realism is where it's like it's it's much more of a contemporary kind of novel, but it has just kind of this magic elements that just kind of exists in the real world. Like, I know Kingdom of Back is kind of magical realism. What other book? Isn't, like, Attic LaRue magical realism or something like that, maybe? Where there's just kind of, like, these magical elements to everyday life. Where there's just kind of this magic kind of in the real world. I don't know a ton of magical realism book, because this is not something that I would read. I think, like, it's not even fine. Like, I, that's not, it is not my thing. It's just not. Maybe, well, have y'all read Terry Brooks's Night of the Word books? Uh, it's not a Shannara books, but I think, is the Night of the Word, would the Night of the Word books be considered magical realism? If it is, those of you who have read it, because I know there's some, because come on, come on old timers out there like me, uh, because most people don't read Terry Brooks now, it's like, it's too old fashioned, but I really enjoyed the Running with the Demon series, that's what the first book was called. Yeah, I think it was the Night of the Word series. I think that's magical realism, in which case I'm going to put that at fine. If it's not, those of you who read Running with the Demon, that series by Terry Brooks, if it's not, tell me and I'll move magical realism down to pass. But if that's it, I, do li I did like that series, so I think it can be fine. Quest fantasy. Um, so, you can see the picture here is Lord of the Rings because that is... I mean, the quintessential quest fantasy. Yeah, they're going on a quest. Like, the object of the fantasy book is to accomplish a quest of some kind. That's not my favorite thing. I don't dislike that. And I think it's probably better than fine. Um, I mean, you know, D&D &D is my jam. Like, pretty much every D&D &D novel is a quest fantasy. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty good. Quest fantasy is pretty good. It's pre pretty good. Uh, pretty good. Um... Yeah, it's just, you know, banding together and going to get something done. Arthur, ugh, I don't like King Arthur. I like Sword in the Stone, the Disney movie. Uh, but I don't like King Arthur, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Arthurian legend. I'm not a big fan of that real time period. Now, I've heard Winter King is amazing. I say this when I'm about, I'm about to read Bernard Cornwell's, uh, sorry, Bernard Cornwell's um, Winter King, which I do want to read. But... There's a reason I haven't read a whole bunch of Arthur stuff. Like, I read Once Future King in high school, and I read uh, Miss of Avalon in high school, and, I mean, they're fine. I just don't, I don't know. It's not really my thing. I don't watch Merlin. Um, Arthurian fantasy's fine, I guess. I just, I hate Lancelot. And Merlin is a wizard who is, like, who has really unspecific and undefined powers. <sighs> He's like, ugh, he's lame, like Gandalf. Like, what powers does Gandalf actually have? Can anybody answer me that? Weird, weirdly unspecific and vague. I don't like, I don't really care for it. I mean, it's fine, I guess. I'm not going to pass. But it's it would take a lot for me to read an Arthurian retelling. Um, and the reason I'm reading Winter King and uh, that series, because I've heard such good things about it. Um, so I'm going to say Arthurian fantasy is fine. I might put it up. I might put it... Um, maybe above Portal Fantasy, yeah. And then you have Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, which is both. Um, all right, Assassin fan. <sighs> I don't like assassins. My problem with assassins is that by their nature, assassins are supposed to be really good at their job. Like they are supposed to be able to assess to kill someone without detection. That is that is their purpose. But because of the nature of storytelling, they can't be too good at it or else the bad guy's gone and there's no conflict. Or the assassin is the bad guy and he can't be good be good at it because then the heroes are dead and there's no story. So by the nature of assassins being, being the focus of the story, it, it has undermined the coolness of assassins. Now, I say this uh, having played uh, and platinumed Assassin's Creed 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, Liberation, Black Flag, and Rogue. <laughs> so, and in addition, one of my favorite characters growing up was Artemis and Trieri from uh, the Dritz books before they just decided that they don't know what they're going to do with the characterization of any character in those books. But I really liked Artemis and Trieri until after the Silent Blade is when I stopped liking really uh, Artemis and Trieri. So I really like that. But Assassin books, 
like, that's one reason I haven't read Brent Weiss's Nine Angel trilogy. Um, I like Callum just fine from Malazan, but I really, a book focused on assassination, it's just not something that appeals to me. So, uh, I'm gonna say it's fine. I would like it above Arthur. So, yeah, it's fine. Coming of Age, oh, I don't like, again, this goes back to the whiny thing, I don't really like younger protagonists. This, and this just because I'm not, I'm not young anymore. Like, I'm old. Like, I liked this way better when I was younger. And young protagonists tend to be annoying. Uh, there, are some protagon there are some authors who can write young protagonists really well. Um, I think John Gwynn is one of them. Uh, Daniel Abraham is another. And so, like, I normally don't like this. Like, this is normally kind of like a pass for me. Uh, this is another reason that I don't really like Stephen King as much as I used to. is because Stephen King writes coming-of-age stories like nobody's business, but I don't really like coming-of-age stories anymore. Like, I have to witness 150 coming-of-age stories every year with my students, and it's just, like, if that's what it's about, like, I, I think I'd kind of take a pass if that's just like, oh, let's learn how this kid, like, normally, nah, I mean, maybe it's fine. I'll put it at the bottom of it's fine, but it's not really my thing. Um, it is not enough a big enough draw. Steampunk. So, I have a very troubled relationship with steampunk because steampunk may be one of the coolest, bloody aesthetics and settings ever. And yet, why is there no steampunk novel that everyone is talking about? I'll tell you why. Because the seminal work of steampunk has not yet been written. There is no one series that we can point to and say, this is it. This is what brings steampunk uh, to the mainstream. This is what booms steampunk as incredibly, incredibly popular. And, and that hasn't been written because for some reason when people go to write steampunk, they are so focused on sticking gears and goggles on everything, which is cool. I love gears. I love clockwork stuff. Clockwork stuff may be my, my, mo my favorite thing in any, any books. Any aesthetic, clockwork, is always my favorite. Like, I have pocket watches that you can see the gears and I will stare at them for minutes at a time because that is just something I love. And I love airships and I love dirigibles and Flintlock Fantasy and Steampunk to me are super closely related. But everyone is so obsessed with the steampunk setting when they write these steampunk books is they forget that people also want interesting characters and an interesting narrative. And so most steampunk stories um, and the, the you know few steampunk books I've read, because there are not many, they're fine at best and, well, they're mediocre at best and they're garbage at worst. Stop focusing on your clockwork gear, goggle hats and make an interesting story. If you know of an excellent steampunk novel, please tell me. Please tell me. But, I mean, I, like, we have a couple kind of borderline steampunks. Like, I'd say Arm of the Sphinx is borderline steampunk. Um, so I love steampunk. I just don't know any books that are good that are steampunk. So I'm going to say steampunk for me. I love steampunk. So I'm going to put it as so good, even though I don't really know any books that are so good. Man, what a waste of opportunity. I love steampunk stuff. Um, it may be, guys, maybe you will write the breakout work of steampunk, and I'll read it. Just, just let me know. <sighs> erotic fantasy. All right, trashed here. So erotic fantasy is the fantasy that that is heavy in romance, and it's not just heavy in romance. It's explicit in its romantic scenes. Guys, I've said it before, I don't like sexy times in my books. I don't like it when people are jumping each other's bones in my books. It's just not something that I read books to, 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 to read about. I just don't. Like, it's just not my thing. Like, do I realize that that is what people do in, in life? Yes, I do understand that. I understand how, how human life um, persists. I do understand that. It's just not something I want to read about, and it's certainly not something that I want to stop the action and have these big, long, in-depth, very specific scenes. It's, I, it's, I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. Freaking Akatar had one, and it's just like, why? Like, 
how am I enriched by having seen this? Like, I am much, I much prefer Fade to Black. Like, I much prefer Fade to Black. But I hate, I hate erotic fantasy because clearly, like, you have to put that, apparently that adjective has to be there because that is the draw for that fantasy novel. No, get out of here. It's trashed here. I almost called this tier erotic fantasy. All right, next we have alternate history. This is an interesting one. So I'm going to say alternate history for me is pretty good, and that's just, that's just because I find history interesting. So alternate history is going to be stuff like Temeraire, which is literally the Napoleonic Wars, because Napoleon is, the, is a villain in these books, even though it is also dragon fantasy and it's also flintlock fantasy, it's a, because it has that technology and it has dragons, but it is also has real-world implications. It's like alternate history is like sharp, but with some fantasy uh, with some fantasy elements, like, but it, but it's literally we're talking about Arthur Wellesley and Napoleon and things like that. Um, currently, on one of the Flintlock series that we have is Thief Taker by DB Jackson, which is, uh, which is it takes place in the during the time of the American Revolution, where they are. It's it's like, it's, it's like Harry Dresden, but in the Revolution. So it's Dresden Files, but you know in revolutionary Boston. And so that kind of stuff is alternate history. I actually read one of the first books that I reviewed on BookTube, um, which is why there's not a review for it, because I went back to edit it later and just I was just not happy with it at all. It's called Into the Storm by Taylor Anderson, which is about this battleship uh, during World War II over in the, over uh, by Japan, or over in Asia, uh, fighting this Japanese battleship. And this they pass through this huge storm and get taken to this uh, land that is essentially identical in geography, but instead of humans, like these animal races evolved, um, like there's these lemur cats essentially, and then this race of like crocodile people, uh, lizard people who are terrifying, terrifying. And so that's kind of like a portal fantasy and an alternate history. And I read the first one and it was good. I mean, it, it, it was pretty good. It was probably solid three and a half stars. It was, I mean, I didn't love it, but it was good. Um, especially if you really want to know about naval uh, battleship terminology, but I never read the second one. Um, but it has a, ugh, it was good. Like it has like an abattoir scene, which is that. But so I think alternate history can be cool. It just depends on what alternate history it is. So if it was a book set in the American Civil War, I don't care. Like I don't care. I don't care. I have never. I just. I don't love American history as it is. I'm an ancient history person or Napoleonic era, and it's really that. You know, like mid medieval history. That's 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 the professor's uh, thing. Doctor Doctor Chase he, uh, Philip is the is the medievalist. That's not me. Like I don't really even like Rome after the fall of the West. So it really just depends. So I think I'd say alternate history is pretty good for me. Mythic fantasy. So this is your fantasy that has elements of classical mythology. So I would actually say that uh, Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn is mythic fantasy um, because it has it pulls from Norse actual Norse mythology. Um, Percy Jackson is obviously mythic fantasy while still being middle grade. Um, anything that American gods, anything that pulls from classical um, established mythology is mythic fantasy. And you know, I don't hate that. Um, I like Shadow of the Gods a lot, so I'm going to say that's pretty good too. I like mythic fantasy um, as well. All right, media tie-in fantasy. So um, pass, and it's at the bottom of pass because. I don't like reading extended universe stuff. I don't like re I don't like playing video games or reading books. Uh, like I don't like reading books that came from the video games. So when Michael and I were talking about Mass Effect, Michael has read the Mass Effect books. I don't I don't I just don't do that. I never have. It's just not my thing. Like I love Mass Effect. I'm just not going to read the Mass Effect books. Star Wars is the biggest thing for this. Like, there's so many Star Wars novels, but it began as the Star Wars movies, and so now it's media tie-ins, or now it's books in the kind of Star Wars universe. It's not fan fiction because they are canon. Like, it's anything canon, not fan fiction. Um, so, so yeah, it just has never been my thing. Star Trek novels, uh, video game novels, I just don't read them. I don't, I never have. I can't think of one that I've read. I never have, I'm not going to. It's it's a pretty hard, it's not trash, because I don't think they're bad. I, th I think erotic fantasy is bad, but yeah, I'm just never gonna read them. Urban fantasy, so. Urban fantasy is a mixed bag. I am going to say urban fantasy is pretty good because I do like modern day settings with fantastical elements. The problem is that urban fantasy often 
overlaps nearly completely with paranormal fantasy, which is like the Cassandra Clare Shadowhunters is. Uh, paranormal stuff where it takes place in a city and just like oh there's Buffy the Vampire Slayer is paranormal is paranormal fantasy which I liked Buffy but I just like I like the city setting more than I like the oh there's werewolves disguised as people in this city um I don't like that as much. I like I just like the city setting. I wish things that weren't that were happening. Yeah, and I think it has to be, and it has to be contemporary cities. Like it can't just be a, a fantasy book that takes place in a big city. Though that would be cool too. So it's fine. Dresden. I like Dresden. I've only read the first book, but I do like Dresden. Um, so yeah, it's pretty good. I like I like urban fantasy. I know Kevin Kevin the Undying. That's his favorite. He gives most of his four and five stars to urban fantasies. Sword and sorcery. So sword and sorcery is is one of the old school old school style fantasy books or fantasy things. This is, I think, Conan the Barbarian. So Sword and Sorcery, it's called that because the um, the protagonist is usually a sword fighter, you, uh, usually a blade wielder, and the antagonist is usually a wizard of some kind. So it's the evil wizard and the good barbarian, which is what Conan was. Not really super common anymore um, from my understanding. Like. Things have just kind of grown out of sword and sorcery. Sword and sorcery is one of like the early subgenre. A genre. So uh, I don't like this. Pass. I'm not gonna read ba really basic stuff. You know, it's got those those covers with Conan standing you know, raising his sword, and um, you know, there's half naked woman at his feet and stuff like that's. I don't know. It's just not my thing. Pass. 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 Fantasy romance. So this. You may be like, Alan, that's the same as erotic fantasy. It's not. So Fantasy Romance is a fantasy book that is heavy. It's a romance book that's just fantasy. So it's a fantasy book that has uh, heavy romantic elements uh, that may or may not be erotic. Um, so fantasy elements that don't necessarily have to be. You can have, I think you can have a fantasy romance book that fades to black. I don't think it has to be super explicit. Um, and so that's why it's not trashed here because... Uh, though I am a pass on fantasy and romance because I'm not going to read a book. Romance is not the reason that I read books. It's just not. If there's a good romance, that's awesome, but it's not why I read. Though I'm probably more likely to read fantasy and romance than I am to read a Conan novel. Um, but it's a pass for me. I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm not gonna seek out. What is it from Blood and Ash? People keep trying to get me to read. I have a couple fantasy and romance books in my Pitcher O Punishments, um, but I don't lose anymore. So I guess that's never gonna happen. Dragon fantasy. All right, let's talk about dragons. So I think dragons are overrated. Now, hang on. Here's why. I used to, I was obsessed with dragons when I was a child. And I always played D&D. &D, and, you know, in pretty much every D&D &D book, there's a dragon. There's just a dragon everywhere. Well, really, in every Dragonlance book, there's certainly a dragon. But I was talking about this with Angela because one of our options for, one of our high ranking options um, for the kind of flintlock fantasy thing is Anthony Ryan's Draconis Memoriae. And it's so much about is awesome, but then there's dragons. And it's because, so dragons for me are lazy, in my opinion, because dragons seem like just the lazy way of, I need something big, threatening, and, uh, you know, like of incredible power, but I am too lazy to think of any kind of creature on my own. So I will just throw a winged lizard that breathes fire. And that's it, and call it a day. So it's not dragons themselves. It just seems like it's become shorthand for any kind of like big danger for the heroes. Dragons can be done really cool. I'm not saying that all dragons are bad. I'm just saying that to me, dragons just kind of feel like a cop out nowadays. So it really just depends on what's being done with a dragon. Because a lot of times dragons are just like, oh, big, like, okay. Like the fact that it's big isn't good enough for me. The fact that it breathes fire, I mean, you're just, that's just lazy. Like, it's just lazy at this point. Like, have you played a game of D&D? Make it breathe something else. Like, just having a dragon that breathes fire, it's just it's just lazy. Like, I just don't, I don't know. It's just not my thing um, anymore. I used to love dragons, so it's not like I hate them. It's just when I see dragons in a book, I'm like, ugh, all right. I, like, I have to enjoy it despite the dragons, not because of. But I do think dragons are pretty good. I don't think they're fine. Um... I would probably put dragons after urban fantasy, but I'd put mythic here. Quest? Get out of here, Quest. You're not my favorite. Um, there we go. Yeah, probably like that. I'll organize these in a second. All right, uh, three more. Dying Earth Fantasy. Um, I haven't read a bunch of Dying Earth Fantasy. I know Broken Earth Trilogy is one of these. So I don't really have any preference for Dying Earth Fantasy. I haven't read a lot of it, so that I can't really judge this one. 
Um, but I do think when the world is ending, it is cool. I probably like that better than Portal Fantasy. Um, yeah, it's fine. Well, I actually probably re rather read about a dying Earth than Arthur. Yeah, there you go. That's fine. Um, uh, Wuxia. So Wuxia is this is a freaking cool genre that is based on um, Imperial China, and it, it deals with chivalry and martial arts. And um, again, like has a uh, a something that is analogous to uh, Imperial China. It's kind of an Asian inspired fantasy. Not all Asian inspired, but you know the Chinese Asian inspired, where um, you know there there's there's lots of martial arts and they they you know wield swords and it's got you know um, um, Asian mythology in it. And it's just a it's a cool genre. And I don't think I've read a bunch of them. Um, and I, I, again, I, I actually don't know if it's just, if it, if it just is Chinese inspired. I mean, its name is Chinese, so I'm assuming, but I like stuff that's Asian inspired. So I think this is cool. Um, so wuxia stuff, I'm not a big martial artist stuff. I don't really like martial arts in my movies and books and stuff. Uh, but I do like sword fights and I do like, um, Asian inspired things. So I'd probably actually put that... I think Wuxia is cooler than urban fantasy for me. Yeah, I'd put it pretty good. Oops, sorry. Um, and then finally, Grimdark. So, Grimdark fantasy is... Uh, my buddy Mark at Slowly Red made this really good Grimdark award. A Grimdark kind of like... He explained the subgenres... A genre. Of the subgenre. A genre. Uh, of Grimdark. And one of my favorite things that I heard, because I've never heard it before, I think he made it up, is Grim Hope, where it is grim and it is brutal and the world is bleak and bad things happen for no reason and people die. But it has this kind of like uh, underpinning of hope. Like you, you feel like things are going to get better as opposed to this really kind of nihilistic view. And I think that's the difference between Grim Dark and Grim Hope. Is, and I much prefer Grim Hope. I don't like feeling just bad when I finish reading something. So I like things with grimdark elements. And what I mean by that is like, kind of like this brutal realism. I do like that. Um, but I don't like it to where everyone is being murdered and being assaulted and like, you know, like, you know, everyone's eating babies in the street and, you know, they're picking them up and twisting their heads off and being like, yeah, this baby's not ripe, and then throws the head down. And the other one's like, yeah, look at this. I just killed these two guys, and look, I'm drinking from his skull. Ah, delicious. What? You're drinking from his skull. Look what I did. I just cut this guy open and opened his rib cage and I've turned him into a toboggan. So look, you hold on to either side of the ribs and woo, sliding down on this dead body. Like, that's just too much. Like, I can't, I do like Grimdark though. I probably like Grimdark more than, uh, more than some people, not more than most, but more than some people. So I do like Grimdark stuff. Um, but not, there's just a level of Grimdark that I can tolerate. It's more than fine. I might put Grimdark here. And it's definitely pretty good. So yeah, it's a pretty even distribution. I like that. Um, in the so goods, where do I need to put military fantasy, swashbuckling, um, flintlock fantasy. Okay, I'm going to put flintlock fantasy first, followed by swashbuckling. This is because flintlock fantasy can scratch my military fantasy itch. Um, if I can only have, you know, one. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's fine right there. Um, that's pretty well ordered. So yeah. So guys, um, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Um, you know, maybe you didn't know about some of these, uh, sub-genres. A genre. Um, and maybe, I, you know, you're now excited to do your own, which d d please do. If you end up, if you want to do this, please do it. Take my template, do it. Please make sure to tag me because I'll watch every single one of you, uh, who do this because I'm always so fascinated to see what kinds of stories people like the most. Um, no one has to ramble as long as I have because I'm not sure anyone can ramble as long as I have. Why do I talk so much? Seriously, what is my problem? But this was a blast. I don't do a tier list a lot. Um, I don't know if you guys want to see more tier lists. If you do, let me know. Um, if you have any comments about, I'm sure you guys have strong opinions about the things that I have said. Um, if you know any really good books 
in any of these subgenres, let me know down in the comments. I'm super excited to engage with you guys um, in the comments on this particular video. As always, guys, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time. The sword and sandal genre. A Japanese cartoon genre. A TV genre. 1970s genre of film. The 60s musical genre.